Um, when I first came, my background is in history, um, specifically uh, European history. Um, but when I came to Sarasota and saw the backyard of the Caribbean, I started traveling. Like many of you, when I travel, I want to also know where there's some, uh, you know, mishpacha around. And I like to see and find uh, what kind of Jewish tours or what kind of interesting things uh, were happening. Uh, what I found was that the Jewish experience of the Caribbean was generally unknown. It didn't seem to have a whole lot of at least popular literature at the time, um, but it was tremendous. Um, there's a tremendous history here in the Caribbean. And then of course, uh, the uh, Edward Kritzler book, which many of you may have read called The Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean came out and had a lot of brouhaha. Um, it became a very popular on the Jewish uh, book circuit. Um, however, as I read it, then I started reading other things and uh, really delved deep into the Jewish pirate experience. Um, and found out there are some big holes in his uh, interpretation. But, you know, first of all, you're Jewish and pirates. Pirates, we know morality. And so, of course, there's a lot of discussion. And so today I'm going to bring you what I have learned so far. And yet I still expect a lot of discussion because the reality of the historical data on who was a Jew regarding the pirates is a little bit sketchy. We have a line here, we have a Hebrew manuscript, manuscript there, but there's not really a compendium of uh, work. And uh, for those of you who might wanna study it, here's a possibility or for your children or grandchildren's doctoral thesis. I'm gonna share my screen so we can um, actually uh, see what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So. so the Jewish pirates of the Caribbean. Let me hope that it can work. To give you some context, um, prior to, in the Middle Ages, not all was great with uh, being Jewish in Europe, as we probably know. Uh, if you remember your European history. However, one of the areas uh, the Jews of Spain went heavily into was uh, the Mallorcan cartographic, cartographic school. They were cosmographers, navigo, navigation instruments, and they were really one of only two schools. The other was the Italian school um, who really created the maps that sailors were to use. And most of the sailors of the time uh, enjoyed, preferred the Mallorcan school. So we have Jew Jews really dominating this industry. Uh, this is one of the maps that was actually uh, kept, it's in the Louvre now, um, and it's one of the more beautiful maps uh, and uh, exhibits. Uh, and this was, kept by France from the Middle Ages on. The astrolab, which was a key item that allowed the age of exploration to begin, was devised by uh, Jews. And it allowed, before then, they could not really take uh, measurements as to and figure out where they were. So it wasn't as much that they thought the world was flat as you may have thought in elementary school. It was more that they didn't have any way to navigate. Um, Abraham Zakuta was the person who really made this possible and he was the inventor of creating a metal astrolabe. He was born in Spain, but he became the royal astronomer to King John. And his book, which is called The Great Book, um, really is the item that many have used at the time to figure out where they were. In fact, Vasco da Gama was inter interviewed and learned how to circumnavigate the globe by him. Columbus used these tables when he was shipwrecked in Jamaica for a year um, to predict accurately an eclipse, which if the legend is true, scared the uh, 
uh, scared the native populace at the time. This is a picture that is supposedly supposed to be of him. Um, he never converted, even though the Inquisition happened while he was alive, but he did flee and he died, did make his way to Israel. So we do have to talk about Columbus and the Jews. Contrary to some popular belief, there really is no evidence that Columbus had any Jewish uh, DNA, etc. Um, however, he did know a lot of Jews and his interpreter, Louis de Torres, was born a Jew at this time during, uh, which I'll get to, new Christians or uh, conversos were very common and people trying to make their way and becoming crypto Jews. Uh, another one of his sailors, Rodrigo de Triana, was considered, uh, was also a crypto Jew, or at least that's the belief, uh, and he was the first European to see the Americas. So let's talk about the age of exploration, because we have to talk about that before to talk about piracy. All of these, um, all of these new navigation instruments allowed Columbus and others like him to explore the, the uh, globe for trade routes. Probably the most important person during that time was Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, who, who financed expeditions um, to try and get to the Orient um, and his expeditions went around Africa. Spain wanted to go to, also go, but they were looking for a different route. And that is how Columbus ended up um, going and finding the Americas. What was life like for Jews on the Iberian Peninsula? After the 12th century, not so great. Uh, we like to talk about the golden age of Spain and compared to everything else, it was uh, a place of uh, relatively calm compared to many other places. However, wars, natural disaster, and mainly the plague created a uh, time of intolerance, um, especially the massacre in 1391, which is known as the Great Catastrophe, um, really uh, influenced Jews to move away from Spain. People, oops. People were moving away uh, from Spain prior to the expulsion. However, um, there were at least 100,000, as we know, who had to flee when the Al there was the Al Alhambra degree and expulsion. What was happening as the Jews who were still Jewish were leaving, people became new Christians and there became a because it was easier to convert than to move for some families, obviously. Um, but then since there was no, be, no Jews to be a state scapegoat, scapegoat, the populace turned on the new Christians and there became um, edicts at that time to show blood purity, that you had been a Christian for at least four generations. This influenced how upset the Jewish community um, became, and especially the new Christian community, and how they wanted revenge on um, Spain because of intolerance. In 1494, two years after um, Columbus sails the ocean blue, there was a treaty between Portugal and Spain that basically divided the world in half. Um, the red parts are Spain, the blue parts are Portugal. They did this without talking to any other European countries or any other seafaring countries. So the rest of the world thought this was ridiculous and didn't pay attention to it. Actually, Spain and Portugal only adhered to it slightly. This is called the Treaty of Tordesilla, but this again enables nation sanctioned piracy because England wasn't going to really pay attention to this because they weren't involved in this. And certainly the Dutch um, were not going to, Netherlands weren't going to pay attention to this. And of course, Spain felt, well, the Pope had sanctioned it, therefore it's ours. So this creates a lot of enmity. The Jews were kicked out of Spain. They wanted revenge. Some, they scattered to the winds. We know the history, or we can do that at another time. But many Jews settled in the Ottoman 
empire, some joined with the Muslim in an anti-Christian piracy of the, um, of the Mediterranean. Probably the most important Jewish pirate of this time uh, was Captain Sion Rees, who secured the Ottoman victor victory against the Andrea Doria, uh, against Andrea Doria. You probably have heard of Andrea Doria and the Spanish fleet. He worked with Barbarossa, who was the scourge of European shipping at the time. He would not have considered himself as a pirate. Spain felt he was a pirate. Sion Rees felt that he was a loyal subject of the Ottoman Empire. So we get a little bit confu confused. Um, another pirate at this time um, was uh, Yaakov Koryel. He was born to a new Christian family and he was actually part, a captain in the Spanish fleet until he was caught, until the Inquisition caught up with him. Now, sometimes the new Christians were actually not new Christian. They were Christians who somebody had a grudge against and decided they were Christ, uh, Judaizing. And it's hard to tell the difference because we, again, don't have the uh, a really good historical record. But in this case, Yaakov Coriel was caught by the Inquisition, tied up and put into a dungeon on a ship that he had commanded that were mostly most of the sailors were also new Christians and they freed him because they thought this was ridiculous. He then with those sailors took command of that ship as well as captured at least two others. And he commanded a fleet of at least three pirate ships that raided um, the Barbary coast as well as he, he went to, uh, we know that he went across um, to what we now know as the Caribbean Irish islands, he basically was uh, trying to raid the Spanish um, treasure fleets. He then repented of his pirate ways and ended up in Svat as a student of Rabbi Isaac Luria, who is, of course, the, um, the founder of Kabbalah. And so that is where, why I put the uh, picture. Um, where, I'm not exactly sure where he is buried, but he is uh, supposedly buried. Uh, near Luria. Whoops, this goes too fast. The most famous pirate uh, going a little bit farther in history, um, but of the time close to the expulsion was Samuel Palache. Now there are many spellings of this name. And if you Google it, you will get all of them. And uh, you know, it's like Hebrew uh, alliterations. Uh, some people felt that he was a disingenuous person, shall we say, because it, when he was in Spain, he was Catholic. When he was in England, he was different things to different people. It depended what they wanted. Um, his father had served as rabbi of Cordoba. And but what we know him for is that he was the first professing Jew to settle in The Hague. And he created a minion in his home. He served as an agent uh, for the Sultan, Sultan to negotiate with the Dutch. Um, and he, the Dutch and the uh, Ottoman Empire created a, probably the first um, alliance against Spain. And it's the first known time that we see an alliance of two countries against this was Spain and Portugal at this point in time against another two to help each other out. Um, he asked for permission and received it from Prince Maurice of uh, uh, the Netherlands. He dressed as a Spanish trader when he went to the Caribbean. Um, and so they were willing to work with him, but then he attacked the uh, Spanish trips ships as they arrived from the Americas. Mainly he worked through around the Canary um, Canary Islands. His fleet was with kosher, uh, was, had enough kosher food for his sailors. There was always a minion on his ships. Theoretically, one tenth of the booty was supposed to be given for charity that I'm not sure of. I can't find records, but that's the lore. He was one of the people who theoretically uh, helped to finance the West Dutch West Indian Company. 
Uh, at one point, his ship, uh, he had a battle and it was very leaky. He had to port in England. And at that point, the Spanish ambassador in England had him arrested because he was theoretically a pirate. He put up a, um, and called him a pirate. Um, in his defense, he showed letters of Mark from, uh, which are, is a license so that you could be a privateer from Prince Maurice. And so he uh, was actually acquitted. My favorite uh, legend about him occurs, and it uh, um, it occurs back when he's in the Hague, when uh, he, his carriage he became fabulously wealthy, and his carriage met the Spanish ambassador to the Netherlands carriage, and the Spanish ambassador's carriage had to give way to his carriage because he had pre um, preeminence, and uh, he was considered the more important person, which is. Uh, probably irked the Spanish ambassador to no end. Uh, the picture is supposed to be of him. It is a Rembrandt picture. Um, and uh, we don't, it wasn't, uh, it doesn't say that it was Samuel Palace, but he was fabulously wealthy at the same time that uh, Rembrandt was um, doing most of his Jewish pictures. So I've been talking privateer, pri pirate, what's the difference? What's in the name? So a privateer is a government license to use a private army to attack or plum plunder. They use a letter of mark and reprisal, which is the license. And on the left is an English letter of mark and reprisal. And they are allowed to capture the uh, vessels. Um, a buccaneer is somebody who's actually permanently based um, like Jim at a place like Jamaica and then goes out. And then there's the contrabandistas, so different, of course, different languages had different names for them. A pirate is different than a pi privateer and they had different rules. The pirate um, was someone who uh, attacked and robbed and whereas the privateer had the license to take all of the goods, but usually didn't kill the crew, which is a really important thing for uh, the various merchants. Ironically, the pri privateer would have letters of mark from as many countries as they could figure out, finagle them, so that they would use a different letter of mark depending on who they were um, privateering against. Uh, and. Uh, going after whoever had the better treasure. So, unto the generations. The first I uh, like is that the uh, Subital Duel, who was the son of the great physician Sudel Du, who introduced the potato to Europe, um, became a pirate. And he became a pirate with uh, Henry Drake, who was the son of Sir Francis Drake of uh, the English Armada. They created the Brotherhood of the Black Flag and attacked Spanish ships throughout the Caribbean and South America. Theoretically, they buried over 6,000 pounds of Spanish gold and more in Chile. There have been documents in Hebrew found, but the treasure has yet to be found. So if you want to go on a treasure hunt, this might be the one to do. Another pirate uh, of the early pirate area was David Abrabanel, who you may have heard of uh, the Don Isaac Abrabanel, who actually helped finance um, Columbus. The, his family was murdered um, when they were attacked by Spanish on their way to South America. And at that time, he survived, he was 19, and he joined the British privateer. He sailed under the British name Captain Davis, and he named his ship Yerushalayim. The discovery of Easter Island, although attributed to a Dutch discoverer on Easter, was actually attributed to him in many places. Um, it wouldn't be called Easter Island. Ironically, Easter Island, for those of you who have been there, um, is a, almost a barren rock. They denuded it of all trees. But when he um, visited uh, 
uh, Easter Island, it, was, it still had lots and lots of trees and it was considered a paradise. Um, just a complete aside, because researching this was so much fun, um, Alexander Solomon, who was actually an English Jewish Tahitian, was the last ruler of Eastern Island until it became part of Chile. And he's the one who do, they developed the tourist industry there. He wasn't a pirate, but it's fun anyway. So another important pirate, um, important to us in America, is Simon Fernandez. He was a converso. Um, we know that, but um, we also know that when he was charged with piracy, um, he converted and then he became a uh, very uh, important ally of Sir Walter Raleigh. He is the one who piloted the failed mission to Roanoke. And his map, which is what's above, um, is uh, used to justify the claims to North America. What's not as well known is whether or not he, uh, he deliberately sabotaged the Roanoke ex exhibition, uh, expedition. He was supposed to pilot them to the Chesapeake Bay. I mean, he was supposed to pilot them to, uh, yes, um, to Massachusetts actually. And he, uh, he had a fallout with the leader of the expedition, White, who is the records that we know of are all from him. And so it was said that Simon Fernandez abandoned them and told them when they realized they were not at the right place that they couldn't get back on board. Another important of the early pilots, another Jewish um, pilot was Antonio Fernandez Caraval. He was also a Portuguese Jewish mer merchant who was able to, through his merchant smuggle slash smuggling um, ways was, able to import 100,000 pounds of silver per year. During the seizure between England, the war between England and Spain, he was able to convince Spain not to uh, seize his ships. And he helped advance money to Cromwell during uh, the, uh, the revolution. Cromwell was very much in his debt and fat, and gave him the ability to have a permanent residence in England. He was the first Jew allow, professing Jew to allow, allowed to remain in England. And then he threw his weight um, behind getting more Jews to, in, to allow them to um, be in England. And this is the proclamation um, of Jews being allowed to be in England. Where did Jews go in the Caribbean? Because they were fleeing. And let's be realistic. We have too many people coming into Sarasota, many of us might think, although the people coming to Sarasota might think this is a true paradise with lots of room. Um, many of the Jews fleeing Spain would go to Amsterdam or try and find homes in other places. And the people who lived in Amsterdam thought, all right, already, we have, we've had enough. So they helped finance Jewish migration or converso migration, especially to the Caribbean. One of the first islands was the island of Hispaniola. Hispaniola, for those of you who remember history, is the place where um, Columbus first landed uh, in, North, in North America. Luis de Torres, never returned to Spain. He and a few others stayed in Hispaniola. So you can say that's the first Jewish settlement. Uh, in the 1700s, the French and Spanish divided the island uh, between them and it became the Dominican Republic. Most of the Jews who lived there hid their identities. Um, and however, one of the interesting things is uh, the they were willing to take World War II refugees and most of the 3000 Jews who live there now live between Sosa, which was supposed to be this Jewish settlement and the capital 
in Dominican Republic. President Franco, Fra Francesco Enriquez y Caraval was a descendant of um, the, the pirate slash first Jew in England. Um, so there is a connection. Part of the reasons Jews became the privateer or they were really the merchants behind the privateers was because they had these incredible tra trade routes and connections. In the Caribbean, there were only there were two businesses that made a tremendous amount of money. It was shipping or sugar. The golden age of piracy was between 1660 and the 1730s, and it flourished due to the pirates' ports, which were Port Jama Royal of Jamaica, Tortuga in Hispaniola, and Nassau in the Bahamas. The reason um, for the growth of piracy was that Spain had these rules and they but they couldn't afford enforce their exclusionary trading practices however the other nations didn't have the money or the resources to create navies at that time um the death and so they would hire people to go after spain basically which was the origin of the caribbean pirate the death of the native population as from smallpox and overwork by Spain led Spain to rely on slave labor. And it also offered a new source of profit for the pirates and for the various um, privateers because basically the pirates would take a ship and then they would ransom the slave ship and make a profit on the slaves. Um, this is something that we do need to discuss and we'll discuss later, but um, the France, Netherlands and England continued to smuggle items and they finally uh, set up their own colonies. They would kick out um, Spain from various islands and they realized that as you couldn't find gold and silver uh, much on the Caribbean islands, tobacco and sugar actually replaced gold because there was so much gold that Spain had found, um, it finally was devalued. However, during the 30 years war in Europe, the, there was more national armies of the various countries and the navies also expanded, which meant that there wasn't the need for piracy anymore. Uh, the slide is the main trade routes and those the pirates knew well, and that's where they uh, went to uh, prey on people. So one of the more famous pirates um, occurs at this point in time in the early 17th century. His name was Moses Cohen Anariquez and we do have not, um, information on him. In 1628, um, he was serving with Admiral Piet, um, Piet Hein of the Dutch West Indian Company. And because it's attributed to him because he knew merchants, other Jewish merchants in other countries, he got word of when the Spanish plate fleet was going to win. At that time, what the Span Spain did to protect all the gold and silver coming out of Mexico and uh, Central America is they would put it together um, by mule pack mule and they would have all of the ships leave at one time with big galleons um, as a huge fleet. So hopefully the pirates were would feel that it was too powerful to attack and mostly this worked. However, part of for safety reasons, they always kept when they were actually going to leave a secret. Moses Cohen Enriquez found out the date and he was able to divide the plate fleet and he was able to take 16 ships near Cuba. The hull was supposed to be about $1 million billion in today's money. And ironically, there was no bloodshed. He released the Spanish, the sailors to Cuba. He didn't kill anybody. He took the ships, he took the money and ran. One of the things where he went was he created a private pirate island off Brazil and he helped 
get the Portuguese away from um, this area of Brazil and it became Dutch. This is Rusifi. Uh, after the, the, that time didn't uh, last, the golden age of Jewish Brazil didn't last that long. And he was thought to be, have moved to Jamaica and become a advisor to Captain he Henry Morgan. And then he disappears from history. So Ruf, Rufisi, uh, I, my pronunciation may not be the best. I did practice, but uh, this is where we believe that sugar production, uh, how to get sugar from sugar cane really happened. And many people believe that it was the Jews who learned how to do it. Um, it became the center of sugar production in the 16th, 17th century. Uh, it was under Dutch control from 1630 and 1654 and had religious freedom. There were 1700 Jews who lived there during the Hague Day. It had a larger presence of Jews than Amsterdam. Um, the Kalal Zur Israel is the shul and it was the first shul in the, United, in the Americas. Of course, Portugal wasn't so thrilled and uh, they finally took it back, uh, reconquest. Um, the rabbi Isaac Fonesca was a major figure. Uh, he wrote some of the first uh, Jewish uh, services and poetry of the Americas. And he also then went back to, uh, when he went back to Europe, he, he was instrumental in trying to get uh, Jews to be allowed back into, uh, England. There are interesting tours, one of the uh, uh, to see and items to see regarding the synagogue and where to go if you ever go there. Uh, and one of the streets has a sign where it's the, the Jewish street, um, which is now the street of Jesus, but uh, it used to be the Jewish street when uh, the Dutch were in control. Jamaica is another area that the Jews of Rufizi, um, when they had to leave, they, uh, many ships uh, went to Jamaica. In fact, we know of 24 ships full of Jews who left Rufizi, um, one of which got blown off course and it became the ship that ended up in what we consider now New York and met Peter Stuyvesant who was not happy to see them. But uh, those of the, us who uh, are going back to Jamaica, um, part of the reason Jamaica was a positive place for Jews to go was that it was not, uh, that it didn't have the Inquisition. Although Spanish controlled, uh, it was a fiefdom awarded to Columbus and his air it was also in the middle of trading routes so it was a great for a merchant base interesting enough one year after the jewish refugees arrived they worked to um they petitioned england to help save the the country from spain because they were going to uh, spain wanted to bring in the inquisition and so uh, they did this by uh, telling England that Columbus is gold mine because there's always this idea that Columbus found gold and hid it. Um, and so the British should take over. It wasn't, uh, Jamaica wasn't well fortified at that time. Uh, England did take over um, Jamaica and Port Royal, which became the home to privateers um, started thriving and the community of Jews um, started thriving. Um, they created a term called forced trade. This is when merchants and privateers worked together for their best interest. In 1720, 18% of the population, possibly as high as 20% was Jewish. Um, they said 13 out of the 47 delegates to the assembly in Jamaica um, were Jewish and they didn't hold the deliberations on, on Shabbat. We do know that in the Jewish cemetery, they found 50 graves with a skull and crossbones. That is not necessarily mean that they were pirates, but we'll get to that. 
What is interesting is Henry Morgan, who we know of as um, Henry Morgan Rome, Rum, he didn't repent of piracy. He, when England said no more privateers after the Thirty Years' War, he moved to uh, Jamaica and became government uh, a governor there. Ironically, he became a very harsh um, governor. During his term, he executed 400 to 600 pirates by hanging. Jamaica is another place that Jewish refugees um, went during World War II. So if you've read the book, you'll see uh, the Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean. He talks about different um, Jewish names for pirate ships. The reality is, although there are Jewish pirates, as you can tell, most of the Jewish pirates we know are would be new Christians. We only have a few who profess Judaism and stayed Jewish. Mostly Jews were the merchants, were the money behind um, the ships. There were some um, Jewish ships, like the Jewish-owned ships, like Queen Esther, um, which sailed under a lot letter of mark. My favorite is the Witch of Endor, uh, which was used by Horatio Hornblower. And then we know of the prophet Daniel, who uh, has an interesting history too. So it's hard to know if they were either Jewish ships or funded by Jews, uh, but there were a number of um, Bible name ships. The Jewish Jews, when they arrived in the New World, uh, helped finance a lot. Established communities in Europe helped finance migration to the colonies. There were fully functioning Jewish communities throughout the Caribbean, um, from Suriname to Curacao and um, to the Barbados and Jamaica. Um, the rabbi of Curacao, which is uh, the picture is the Curacao, one of the Curacao um, synagogues admonished his, co his congregates for raiding ships owned by fellow Jews. So Curacao was one of the um, big places where Jews were in shipping. One of the interesting things is the, uh, to note of history is the Jolly Roger flag. It really wasn't known as a pirate flag until Hollywood got hold of it. Um, the first reference is 1724. Um, the skull and crossbones that we do see in both of these uh, tombstones are uh, Jewish tombstones. It was a symbol of death to remember that life is fleeting um, more than it's a pirate symbol. And um, these were symbols, um, the flags, well, the first one uh, were thought to have been on a Jewish ship. We have to talk about Jews in the slave trade. It's one of the issues that continually comes up. Um, the definitive work is uh, on it is Jews, Slaves, and the Slave Trade by Eli Farber, if you want more information. It's a historical fact that Jews did participate. They acted similarly to the culture in which they lived. What Eli Farber did, Farber did was really go through all historical document, uh, documentation and he, he did a numbers game with actuarial ta tables, which if that interests you, go for it. I started getting a little bit crazy. What he found was that Jews tended to own fewer slaves than their non-Jewish peers, um, and that they were investors, but not board members of the Dutch West India Company. Urban slaveholders owned fewer slaves than rural slaveholders, and Jews were not major plantation owners or farmers. So of all the Jews that we know were in the, uh, in the Caribbean, there were less than a dozen serious slave traders, which does not excuse anyone, but we, uh, those who were, were actually, there were four slave, slave traders from, uh, from Rhode Island. Um, that were probably the biggest of any of the slave traders. Um, but this is a piece that is now actually in the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. It's called a memento mori, again, to remember how, um, how 
short life is, but it does show um, what the, the slave on the right. So Curacao, which I highly recommend going to, it's one of uh, one of my favorite islands of the Caribbean. It's as beautiful underwater as above. Um, it's considered to have the finest natural harbor in the region and uh, is actually, um, Jews thrive there. It's a Dutch um, port, so do Jews gravitated there. The synagogue has a sand floor like most of the Sephardic synagogues in the uh, Caribbean, as well as, of course, Amsterdam. Um, the picture above is called Pirate's Bay. It looks very inviting to me, not too scary. Um, right now, that's an actual picture of what it looks like today. Um, it's named that because it, was, it had a deep part harbor. It's hard to tell from Curacao who was a pirate and who was a merchant. They didn't fly their pirate flag until they got until they got to their prey. They actually would uh, fly a national flag or whatever they deemed they were flying under, and then they would change it. Um, part again, part of the reason is because if you were a privateer, there were rules of engagement. Um, today. Uh, Mikveh Israel Emanuel was the oldest active is the oldest act, active uh, Jewish congregation in the Americas, and uh, the cemetery has over three thousand Jewish graves. Another place that was a pirate stronghold is the Barbados, um, which has the oldest mikveh in America, and this is a modern day picture of Nide. Israel, the scattered Israel, uh, which was rebuilt in 1833, and I don't know when they added the purple lights. Um, what's interesting is that all the people of Iberian descent who now live in Barbados are believed to have uh, Jewish roots. Um, Barbados is also known because George Washington visited there, and that's where he contracted smallpox, which he had immunity to when uh, during the revolution. Act um, <clears throat> another famous, more modern pirate is Jean Lafitte from 1780 to 1823. Some people say he lived to 1850, it's hard to know. He lived and worked around New Orleans. He was born from Sephardic parents. The grandparents led, fled Spain to France. Um, and he was born in New Orleans where he was a swamp rat. He really knew the islands around New Orleans, which stood him in good stead as he and his brother Pierre became um, smugglers. Pierre was able to get letters of mark, which meant they were privateers, not pirate. But what they did create was on Bar Barataria Bay, um, they created a pirate island and really their own fleet. They had 50 ships and over a thousand pirates there. Uh, the Americans weren't thrilled with that. The governor at the time took out a, uh, a uh, warrant for him and offered a $30,000 uh, capture um, prize and Lafitte did the same with the governor. Fortunately, neither collected. Um, during the War of 1812, Andrew Jacks, um, I'm sorry, the British came, during the War of 1812, the British came to Lafitte and asked him to, uh, because they knew he had a bounty on his head, uh, asked him to defect. Rather than defect, Lafitte realized that the Americans are likely to win. They just had more power in the area, and it was better for him if the Americans won. So he... Uh, went to uh, to the Americans and to Andrew Jackson and said uh, he would help them and he would give his pirates out not only on the ships but also on land to man the cannon. And it's believed that he is the reason that Andrew Jackson was able to win the Battle of New Orleans nor New Orleans and became what we now know as the Swamp Fox. It's really John Lafitte who was the Swamp Fox. He was feted and everything was wonderful in New Orleans and it seems like he got bored because that was just too legal and he moved to Galveston, uh, Texas, where he became another, 
created another pirate community called Campeche and had a fleet of uh, ships there. Uh, that's where he uh, met uh, Bowie with the Bowie knife uh, and of Alamo fame, as well as uh, he participated somewhat uh, with the Mexican Revolution. In popular culture, he is the buccaneer, and that is Yul Brenner, if you can remember him with hair, um, as well as uh, he's a figure in a Captain Crunch serial in Disneyland, and he's supposed to be the uh, the model of the gentleman pirate that uh, was used for uh, Johnny Depp and the Pirates of the Caribbean. So you get the idea that piracy, it's kind of, are they privateers? Are they merchants? Are they pirates? Not all good, not all bad. Um, but Jean Lafitte was really the last of the uh, pirates that we would say are true uh, true pirate privateers. However, legally we could call our first Jewish Commodore, Uriah Phillips Le Levy, um, a pirate. He uh, was the highest ranking offer at the beginning uh, of officer of uh, Sil during the Civil War. Um, he grew up going to sea. He went to sea at 11, but he actually left um, because he wanted a bar mitzvah and his family asked, uh, asked him to. He fought in the uh, Barbary Wars and that's where he gets his pirate uh, nomenclature. He really hated being called a Jew. He was a proud Jew, and he, but he got into a lot of fights. He was court-martialed at least six times and in fact demoted from rank of captain at least three. Uh, he actually killed a man in, uh, in a duel in Philadelphia. Uh, so not so wonderful in some ways. On the other hand, one of his acts as Commodore was the Anti-Flogging Act and flogging was very was notorious during this time. The first act he did when I assigned his own ship was to put a mezuzah on the door of his cabin. Um, just uh, an aside, because he is a fabulous character, he became a real estate investor in New York and became fabulously wealthy. And he is the one who was, he purchased and restored Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. And uh, he is the one who commissioned the private sculpture of Thomas Jefferson that now sits in the Capitol Rotunda. And he is the one who gave Monticello to the United States um, people. So some good things happen in the end. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and ask you to unmute and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Oh, I, I see that. I Unfortunately, when I'm sharing my screen, I'm not able to see the chat. Um, Lael, would you like me to assist you with that? I, yeah, I, I can now see. I'm sorry, I didn't. Why would Jews be allowed to uh, sail with Columbus? Neither uh, Louis de Torres or um, Tian, uh, the uh, person who first saw the uh, Americas, were professing Jews at that time. They were conversos, they were new Christians. Whether that was, they were truly authentically adherents of the Christian faith or not remains a mystery. Um, oh, Jews America by Saul Friedman is another book. Yes, there are many books on Jews uh, and the slave trade. Yes, Joel. All right. So um, if, if I understand the distinction correctly, there were there were all of these different uh, all of these different variations of sort of government uh, government sponsored or government ordained raiders uh, uh, on the high seas, but they weren't necessarily criminals. Is it, is it fair to say that of all of that group, it was only the people called pirates who were actual criminals in the in the legal sense? Well, you see, that's where it gets fuzzy. If you're on the other side and you capture their their ship, they're a pirate. Um, however, so many of the pirates, especially when you were going to war with England and Spain, Spain certainly felt they were pirates. 
and they acted like pirates and they were just as awful as the pirate movies show them. However, they had letters of mark from England, so they were privateers in England's eyes. It really depended who caught them. So it was kind of a fuzzy thing, okay. Yeah, life is gray. <laughs> Any other questions? I do hope that you'll visit uh, some of the wonderful islands of the Caribbean. I wanted to showcase that uh, the Jewish communities that you can find there and how beautiful some of these islands are. There are Jews are not just in Europe and uh, there, there's a lot to see. Yes, um, I have your name as owner's iPad. So please unmute owner's iPad. <laughs> That's Eric. <laughs> Hi, Eric. There you nope. go. No? Nope. 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 Do it again, Eric. Do it again. And you, you unmuted and then muted again. Hey, there we go. go. Hi, uh, this, is, this is Eric Ferber. I'm just amazed at the amount of research you did. It was just phenomenal. It was really very interesting. I just want to tell the congregation that I'm not related to Eli Farber. <laughs> 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 it's a great book. Talk about research. <laughs> Yeah. He had to go through all of that. The boundaries is, is amazing, so thank you. There's a lot more to discover. As I said, uh, most of the histories are just little fragments of statements. And as I had mentioned, a lot of new Christians were called uh, Judaizers because somebody had an agenda against them. So we don't know who really was a Jew, especially in the uh, new Christian uh, community. Um, and many of the Jews would have also bought um, false papers to show that their families were four, Christ four generations of Christians, um, the, the purity laws. So it, as you say, uh, Joel, it's quite fuzzy. But these are the, the ones I gave you are the ones that I can pretty much uh, guarantee had uh, a true Jewish connection and uh, a positive experience with the faith. Yes, Al. Yeah, you know, just, just to add a little more to Jean Lafitte, uh, he is probably credited with the uh, American victory in the War of 1812. Uh, without his help uh, with Andrew Jackson actually blocking the British fleet and so on, the British might have won the Battle of New Orleans and ultimately uh, they might have gone on to, to win. Uh, if you recall, in the War of 1812, the British actually came into Washington, D.C. and burnt down the White House. So uh, they were a pretty formidable bunch. And uh, Lafitte certainly holds a very important place in U.S. history in, in terms of making sure that War of 1812 was not a lost war on the part of the United States. Absolutely. He's honored. His island, the Pirate Island, is actually a national park now. And there is a Jean Lafitte city and with a museum that you can visit if you're interested. There is theoretically the oldest bar still standing in New Orleans, which you've got to realize is a, a pretty old thing, uh, is named Jean Lafitte Bar. And he's honored today as the gentleman pirate um, and truly recognized for uh, his work. He, his first wife, uh, who unfortunately passed while he was living, uh, was a Sephardic Jew also. So he married in the faith. What a concept. Uh, yes, Joel. So uh, I know you mentioned the War of 1812, and maybe I missed it. What about during the Revolutionary War? The, uh, the United States didn't, didn't actually have a, a Navy at the time and relied a lot on privateers. Uh, is there any history of, of any Jewish history that you know of in there? Well, that's where Uriah Phillips come, uh, Levy comes in, the first Commodore. I thought that was the Civil War. He was, and I'm sorry, I was not clear on that. He was the highest ranking Jew. He was, a, he was the first Jewish Commodore, but he served during the world. He, he went against the Barbary pirates um, during the, uh, so, and as well as uh, he did serve in the revolution. And the Arabs have never forgiven us for that. <laughs> ah, 
so just some fun pirate stuff that I couldn't fit in and it's not Caribbean, but I thought it was great. Uh, in 1984, I believe, I may have my dates wrong, um, that uh, there were Somali pirates, which unfortunately they're still very active, uh, who stopped their ship for Rosh Hashanah. And they made an announcement that we are stopping this. They had captured a Ukrainian vessel um, with people aboard and they made this announcement that they are stopping for Rosh Hashanah, not because anyone of them were was Jewish except for Abe who was half Jewish. He was the accountant in the back office, but they were doing it, stopping everything because of Rosh Hashanah and the holiday. I have no idea what to do with that piece of trivia. So I felt the need to share because I just felt it was so great. Um, the Battle of New Orleans took place after the war of 1812 had ended. Yes, we continue with fuzzy. Not, we didn't have uh, instant media access as we have today. Any other questions? I hope I answered a little bit. Uh, it's fun history and I highly recommend uh, doing some dig digging. Um, we are, uh, many of the Jewish pirates felt that they were emulating the heroes of Jewish history and they wanted to do something rather than just um, acquiesce to Spain. And that is why so many of them were willing to fight specifically and do against Spain. Uh, with the piracy. Well, I thank you so much uh, thank you. for joining me. And I'm going to hopefully, I will look forward to seeing you at future events. And uh, hopefully, Bashana next year in person. <laughs> well, thank you, Alayal. That was a wonderful presentation. We, we knew it would be. My pleasure. Thank you. Have I a great evening.